Well, today we'll be looking at uh, different issues emerging in American culture of the 1830s and 1840s. The Second Great Awakening, Webster Ashburn, Manifestist, Texas Revolution, Speech of the Oregon Country, and Texas Annexation. Now, the 1830s and 40s saw a radical change in American society. It calls for new movements to reform human nature, social Ill, uh, cure social ills from abolition to votes for women. Now, with the Second Great Awakening, you see a new rise in devotion to the church. Evangelical Protestantism really starts taking hold in the United States. Inns in the Northeast in the winters of 1830 and 31 have a series of revivals are held. Lax churchgoers and heavy drinkers suddenly come devout. Christians abstain from alcohol, gambling, all sorts of other biases. Rochester, New York, a thriving industrial area, uh, becomes the most, among, most prominent of these areas. Are reminding a lot of the Puritans in the Northeast about uh, their upbringing. But uh, whatever was said, whatever was done, whoever was saying it, he convinced a lot of people. In a rapidly growing town, the Erie Canal, the growing industry, a rapidly changing society found solace and uh, peace and uh, renewed devotion to the faith. So you have this new spirit of evangelicalism uh, sweeping the country, getting called for the attack on the collective sins of the nation. Exit. Guided by their faith in God, the newly converted, the born again, they are going to change the world. You have organizations attacking war, slavery, alcohol, sometimes even government itself. Evangelists took advantage of the new, the new democratic spirit of the nation by bringing religion to the people. Instead of waiting for them to come to church, they're going out to the people. I still have a lot of uh, preachers this time going from church to church, community to community, week to week. Uh, they're called circuit riders. But you also have these evangelists and revival preachers who are just going out to the communities to preach the gospel. Just tell them what it's about, try to bring them in. So there are many of them established churches are starting going to other local churches. Now, revival these highly energetic church meetings, most commonly formed by Methodists, Baptists, and occasional Presbyterian. They were regular feature society in the Midwest and the South. In the South, the evangelists concentrated mostly on individual redemption. It's on individual symptoms rather than trying to attack larger scale social ills. So what's the biggest one they'd have to attack if they did go to the South? Slavery. But they found a lot of individual sin to keep them busy. Staying from drinking, gambling, dueling. In fact, it's because of these efforts, uh, Second Great Awakening, a lot of anti dueling laws are passed in the South. Uh, radical social forms such as emancipation, they shot away from it. In the North, old Puritan traditions uh, made for especially fertile ground for evangelists, leaving these small, tight knit uh, Puritan communities, uh, the cities, and the factories. Uh, old ideas stayed with them. If they didn't go to church much anymore, it uh, inspired a new devotion and a greater movement for social reform. In 1816, the American Bible Society was organized by Reverend Samuel John Mills. He served 140,000 Bibles in five years. Mainly in the West, where churches really hadn't yet to really fully establish themselves. But others took religion to the slums, the growing of poor areas of the cities, to the ports to convert sailors' religion not dead and poor in great strength. They had a lot of social reform societies, those to stamp out prostitution, gambling, and dealing with irreligious activities on Sundays. There's laws called blue laws as a result of these. You see these across the South, into the 1960s and the 1970s even. Laws closing most businesses on Sundays. Try to keep the Sabbath day holy. I still see a lot of a, I don't see a lot of a church, a lot of businesses open in the South on Sundays anyway because where most of their paying customers are going to be in the South. Church. Well, temperance crusade became very popular. This is probably one of the most uh, popular of the movements, temperance. There's a difference between temperance and prohibition. Temperance is focusing on individual ideas, individual abstinence from alcohol. The individuals are restrained from drinking. Prohibition, they're trying to pass a law against alcohol. Basically making it illegal for everybody. 
This is a serious social problem here in the 1830s, 1820s, and 1830s. Tim's Crusade is very popular because after the American Revolution, whiskey became the most popular version of the United States. Whiskey. These are cheap, usually cheaper than milk for city folk, uh, cheaper than beer, and safer than drinking the contaminated water in the cities. You're not going to drink the cities in the uh, you're not drink the city's water in the 1820s and 1830s. There's no sanitation uh, or water purification processes yet. So in the 1820s, alcohol consumption is triple what it is today per capita. We drink three times more than we do now. So. People drink a lot, they get drunk. Alcoholism is a very big problem this time period. And women played a great role in the temperance movement. They made it a crusade for protecting the home from drunken uh, bandits, abusive husbands. Husbands just came home and uh, drunk, start beating the wife and the kids. Uh, because they were drunk, ordinarily, might not have done anything. They also have chunk husbands who are too drunk to work. Husbands who spend the paycheck uh, drinking. Drink it away. By 1834, there are 5,000 temperance societies across the United States and more than a million members. Very popular movement. And women were able to take a role in this organization where they hadn't been able to take a role in many organizations before. Women are respected as a moral force in the homes. And this is a place that they could really show us. They start getting more involved in civic activities and eventually political activities as well. Relationships between husbands and wives generally became more egalitarian, though laws up to this point still put, uh, put the property rights all to the husband. That is, any kind of a property wife brought into the marriage became the husband's property. Everything was the husband's property. Families became more child-centered, raising children as the main function. But the family size, though, dropped. The average number of children going from 7 to 1800 to 5.4 by 1850. I'm not really quite sure why. Uh, but, uh, like I said, if there was ever a divorce, of course, still very difficult to get. The husbands would get the kids. They would always get the kids. It's only really until the 1920s and 1930s that that starts shifting around with the idea of the 10 year years doctrine that young children need their mothers more. So, divorce cases, husbands start, uh, wives start getting the children almost exclusively. That no matter how bad the kind of mother the uh, woman was, the woman would always get the uh, children. But husband, no matter how good a father he was, wouldn't get the kids at all. But lately, since the 1990s, has been trying to push to make a, uh, custody more equal. Some states are passing equal custody laws, so it's not unusual for husbands to get, uh, uh, not unheard of for husbands to get to custody in some cases, but in many states, so it's very difficult for husbands to do that, no matter what kind of a person they are, compared to what kind of husband, what kind of woman the wife is. Abortions did occur at this time period. Abortions have been going on since uh, the time of memorial. Uh, so it was still legal, it was legal in every state at this point. One historian estimated there's probably one abortion for every five or six live births by 1850. These are unsafe, unsanitary operations, and many women died or sterilized or bled to death. So uh, some states are banning abortion because of that, because they're being performed so badly, because they're botched so often. In fact, by the time of the Roe vs. Wade decision in 1973, only a dozen states allowed abortion. But uh, the Supreme Court decided it was a more of a right for women to decide whether or not they're going to risk their health or their lives out from family planning issues that that decision belonged to women. And so abortion was legalized in 1973, but always been very controversial in American history. Although only in the late 20th century, not the 21st century, has it been uh, as a vocal and violent argument as it is today. Between 1820 and 1850, a rapid expansion of free public schools again, part of that uh, Second Great Awakening. Part of this agitation from working men's societies in eastern cities, uh, print of labor unions had started to organize at this time. Education reformers were shocked by the number of immigrant poor children who lacked any kind of moral training, called for schools to protect pregnancies, public schools, guaranteeing that every child would have an opportunity to go, regardless of their income, 
regardless of who they were, where they're from, everyone had the chance to go to school. The schools need to make up for the deficiency, this deficiency in their morals and training, or otherwise the nation will one day be populated by citizens incapable of self-government. Kids need to be taught right from wrong, how to act properly. They need to be able to know how to read and write and add and subtract. This nation is going to be a democracy. If the people are going to rule themselves, they have to know what they're doing. They have to know how to read and write, they have to understand the law, understand the history, understand how their community works. Forrest Mann, in particular, lobbied, uh, became a great educational reformer. He lobbied uh, Massachusetts for, uh, to create the first state board of education in the country and the more government support for local uh, schools. Created this uh, state board of education in 1837. Uh, Mann became the first secretary of the board and he pushed for the writing what they call, the teaching what they call the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. The very basics. And he did one room schools. Uh, I guess they didn't have a lot of kids in these rural areas, so kids didn't attend very often, so they just tried to teach them the very basics. They have at least some rudimentary education in that little time they had. How to read and write, how to add and subtract, things like that. They also pushed the Protestant ethic, as it's called. Basically, the moral side of moral training. Industry, it's working hard, punctuality, sobriety, that is, abstaining from drink, but also need to be serious at serious times and frugality. Institutions for the insane poor are organized by uh, form societies. Instead of the insane just being locked in basements or dungeons somewhere and being locked away, they try to turn these facilities more into hospitals for them. Places where the sick really couldn't get care. The penitentiary movement began in the 1830s, 1920s, 1830s. Basically, especially pushed by Quakers. Uh, but before this, uh, criminals were often hung in the stocks, publicly whipped and branded. Uh, jails only exist to hold prisoners for short times while their case is going on and to wait for their pot punishment, usually which was a, a large fine or usually often was a public corporal punishment, a public feeding or an execution. Well, Quakers developed that idea that penitentiary is a more humane form of uh, punishment. That is, uh, separate the inmates and all others from uh, uh, society and from themselves so they can just basically go to a small room, think about what they've done, basically, and uh, think about how they're going to prove themselves, come back into society. They have a popular idea that prisons were quickly overcrowded and had a few resources to tend to the redemption of criminals. Basically, came just punishment to separate them from the rest of society for a while. Very few thought, taught any kind of uh, skills, how to reintegrate society, how to get jobs, uh, how to be decent people again, and just let them out. The problem was recidivism. Basically, the prisons basically taught the criminals how to be better criminals, and the criminals went out and committed more crimes. Abolition. Probably one of the uh, Hallmarks of this uh, time period. Uh, people trying to uh, eradicate slavery. American Colonization Society established trying to take free blacks and colonize them in Africa. The nation of Liberia was founded this point. In fact, capital of Monroe. He was named after President James Monroe, who had been a slaveholder on this idea, basically, that if free blacks could not live uh, as equals in this country, so they should probably go somewhere else, start over. They had a natural idea saying Africa. But here's the problem. Very few uh, of the slaves were from Liberia. They're from other parts all over Western Africa, usually. And many of these sl <coughs> slaves were had been in here three or four generations. They had no connection to Africa. About as much connection as many Americans had in Europe. And once the uh, colonists reached Liberia, they had all sorts of new problems. There was no infrastructure there. They had to start over with themselves, and they had these conflicts with the native libraries who already lived there. In fact, the littlest day library has this problem, this deep dispute between the descendants of the American colonists and the native librarians. William Lloyd Garrison, a prominent abolitionist, uh, called for immediate emancipation without immigration, freedom, 
and equality for all. Again, a newspaper in 1831 called The Liberator. It was all about issues in slavery and how people were trying to free them. William Lloyd Garrison. As part of the new evangelism, um, used revivalite meetings to promote abolition in Ohio and New York. Came at hot, these areas came hot as abolitionist sentiment. But many uh, saw abolitionists as dangerous radicals and often have their lives threatened. For example, in 1837, one anti-slavery editor named Lovejoy was killed when a mob from Missouri crossed the, over the Mississippi River in Illinois and killed him and destroyed his uh, printing press. Racism was very prevalent in the North, remember that, but this frustrated the abolition movement in free states and often caused mob violence and they held a rally. But they're using biblical principles to try to promote their cause. That is, it looks like a Deuteronomy and so forth, uh, so condemns uh, slaveholders as man stealers. Many other instances throughout the Bible. The assembly had slaveholders trying to use the Bible to promote slavery. Slaves obey thy masters and so forth. In 1836, slave state congressmen instituted the gag rule preventing abolition petitions from being read on the floor of Congress. Post office began refusing to carry abolitionist materials in the South. But in 1840, abolition supporters organized into the uh, Liberty Party. Party dedicated just to one issue, abolition. It's a big issue, but the thing about American politics is people very rarely vote on just one issue. They now like what the uh, Liberty Party had to say about slavery or uh, other single issue parties about other issues, but if you want to know what else we got. Women also began to assert their rights. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Christian model, organized the first women's rights organization at uh, Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. We're going to call the Seneca Falls uh, Convention. Here they produced a document, um, including uh, about a third of the assignments were men, including uh, Frederick Douglass, a well-known, a free a man who escaped from slavery and a well-known abolitionist speaker. Seneca Falls Convention called for uh, equal property rights for women, the right of women to vote, and equal rights to the family. This is the beginning of the modern women's rights movement. It's going to take decades for their ideas to come to fruition. You also have the 1830s and 40s, the time of great expansion of the United States. Uh, you have distinctive styles of emerging American literature, particularly with men like uh, novelist uh, Herman Melville and the poet Walt Whitman. And uh, more and more, that can be called Manifest Destiny. Is it will cross the United States again, believing it was God's will that America not only expand the sea to shining sea, but expand to take a hold of North America. Mexico and Canada seemed ripe for the taking, and to God's will that America control all of it. The West is also attracting those looking for adventure, fame, fortune, escape from Buddhist persecution, and a new life. The nation is growing rapidly. By 1840, you have a U.S. population of 17 million. Compare that to just 3.5 million 50 years before in 1790s. So millions of Americans are coming into the country. But well, meantime, as far as manifest destiny, we're seeing the border of Maine. Maine never had its border permanently decided on. Uh, and there was a dispute between the U.S. and British Canada with the border of Maine. In 1839, the Maine militia and Canadian lumberjacks fought a skirmish over the border. We have uh, timber rights. What had happened was, in 1842, Webster asked for a treaty. Secretary Daniel Abs at Webster and met with the uh, British ambassador, uh, Mr. Ashburton, and they hashed out, hacked out a treaty. And giving over half the disputed territory to uh, Britain, but uh, Established a firm northeastern border for the United States. We also have other issues, particularly uh, the Oregon country. The U.S. and Britain both claimed it, uh, and the United States, the U.S. claimed the whole thing. 
and the uh, joint occupation, just take it all. But also in Texas, right across the Dean River uh, from the United States, attractive, a lot of good farmland, a lot of people started to become interested in it. Now, the early 1820s, Mexican officials began inviting settlers into Texas to try to settle and develop the area on the condition that they become Mexican citizens. And part of becoming a Mexican citizen, you had to become Roman Catholic. Well, Stephen F. Austin got the first uh, great uh, land grant, inheriting it from his father in 1823. He settled 300 families, overwhelmingly American. In 1830, there are 20,000 Americans living in Texas. Cheap, fertile land. And most people living in uh, settlers in the area were, tech, were Americans. But Mexican politics is very unstable. The average term of the president was about nine months from 1821 to 1867. Santa Ana served as president on uh, 11 different occasions. Dictators and Democrats alike were overthrown, assassinated, succumbed to illness. But in 1829, Mexico freed all slaves throughout Mexico. They had a slaveholding country up to that point, carrying it to Spain. And I was saying no more slavery. I was saying Texas, no more slavery. But many refused to submit to Mexican law because a lot of these American settlers coming in from uh, the United States were coming from the South. Well, Mexican government was corrupt, very arbitrary. Slavery is one of many issues. But 1833, Austin presented a petition over Texas grievances calling for a separate state government from Coahuila, Texas. And they began setting it up without the Mexico City's permission, uh, believing they are going to get permission to do so. But uh, he's arrested for this, for just saying, well, let's go start, st start setting up our own state government. After his release, he joins the call for rising call for revolution against Mexico. It's the game of Texas Revolution. 1835, Civil War again erupts in Mexico. Um, Southern Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula is trying to break away, so Texas is trying to break away as well. Mexican armies spread in different directions trying to suppress dissent. Um, um, Texas uh, claimed it had a need for defense for the tribes on the frontier. Um, but uh, they had a, Mexico imposed a severe restriction on state militias, saying you don't have one militia soldier for every 500 citizens. And Texas didn't have a very large population. This meant Texas would not have a very large uh, defense against uh, on the front on the frontier. On October uh, 1835, the Texas Revolution broke out at Gonzales, Texas, fought between Texas settlers and the Mexican army, and the fight erupts and continues spreading all over Texas, up to southern Texas over the next several months. By March 2nd, 1836, Texas settlers declare their independence. Uh, four days later, they had the fall of the Alamo in San Antonio. The old uh, Catholic mission had uh, fallen. Texas settlers, uh, the Army of Texas settlers had gathered, including Davy Crockett and others, uh, uh, David um, Bowie and others, uh, Jim Bowie and others trying to um, defend it. But it was a wide open area. They were ordered to abandon it and try to regroup, but they refused. They made a stand against a uh, Force of 6,000 Mexican troops, 200 men, and they're all wiped out. Since then, it's kind of a symbol of the resistance in Texas, and Texas' uh, freedom and independence. But over the next several weeks, the situation is getting even worse for Texas. Steady series of defeats and retreats. Uh, finally, at uh, San Jacinto, just outside of Houston, modern day Houston, on April 21st, 1836, you Battle San Jacinto. Uh, Mexican army was taking a uh, resting that afternoon, and uh, Sam Houston gathered his forces quietly and uh, pounced on them, forcing them to surrender within a very couple of hours. At that point, Texas was able to gain its independence. But it's very tenuous independence. It's basically more based on the fact that Mexico could barely defend itself. Texas settlers, meanwhile, are trying to push for an annexation of the United States in late 1836. Vote for it overwhelmingly, but uh, President Jackson, though, was very hesitant to embrace uh, annexation at this point. Houston had been a protege of his, close political ally in Tennessee. He 
made him uh, basically responsible for Houston becoming governor of Tennessee. He was even grooming the presidency when some scandal of, I'm not so sure what happened, uh, involving a, his uh, new wife and their divorce, uh, forced him from office, and he ended up going to Texas. Well, Houston's now president of the Texas Republic, trying to get Jackson to approve a uh, trying to get Jackson to approve a annexation, but Jackson's hesitant about doing this. He knows that Mexico's warning the United States that uh, annexing Texas was also a war. Jackson doesn't want a war, particularly one he can't finish because his term of office is almost over. Plus, the Mexican army was a very strong and powerful force at this time. The numbers were very daunting at this time. So Mexico was considerable power, but was Jackson a willing concern that Mexico would defeat the United States? Not necessarily. I was afraid it just might take a while. What he ends up doing instead is uh, he recognizes Texas independence as one of his last acts in office, March 3rd, 1837. Well, in the meantime, Texas annexation becomes a larger and larger issue. Um, manifest, uh, believers manifest destiny want Texas that bring the whole thing in it's our destiny to encompass this country but others saying no it's not ours we don't need it and others point the fact that the Texas Republic practiced slavery it'd be coming in as a slave state more slave territory and the United States abolitionists uh, said that if you took in Texas it could be divided into six states states all the size of Kentucky all slave states when they should be flooded with slave states. Well, uh, Houston comes back in as a president in 1841. And uh, Mexico invaded Texas. You had these constant fight, skirmishes back and forth over the border. And uh, but Texas now, after a series of military disasters, ready to discuss annexation. Still independence to holding on, but they're having trouble taking care of themselves. Tyler believed in Texas annexation. In fact, uh, Democratic supporters of annexation basically said that, yeah, we bring in slave Texas, it's a slave state, but the idea of balance coming in. Free Oregon coming in the Northwest, taking the British out and annexing all of Oregon, to bring it all uh, as a free state, free territories, and bring in slave Texas, the two would be balanced out. Free Oregon for slave Texas. And Tyler, still a Democrat in many ways, believed in this, but the Whigs are very divided on this. You have one group called the Cotton Whigs, uh, who favored and say, basically Southern slaveholders. The pro slave, uh, pro slavery. Now the conscience Whigs were anti slavery, deeply divided. Well, Tyler is supporting annexation. Now Houston is able to convince many of the United States that, are, uh, that uh, they need to annex Texas by basically. Playing diplomacy, trying to entice Britain and France to uh, be engaged in trade with Texas, missing there's so much trade, so much money to be made in Texas that uh, the United, making the United States jealous and afraid of Britain and France getting its hands on Texas. That many of the United States are anxious to grab hold of Texas and annex it, no matter what the cost, to keep Texas from falling under the influence of Britain or France. Well, yes, Secretary of State this time, an able P. Upshur begins negotiating an uh, annexation treaty with the United States, but he's killed in an accident. Vice Secretary of State by John C. Calhoun, briefly. And the treaty is signed on April 12, 1844, but it fails the U.S. Uh, Senate by a narrow vote. Do you remember, Senate, Anna, Senate to acts on approves all treaties. But the treaty is not approved by the Senate. Tyler, undeterred, waits till after the 1844 election. In this election, Texas and abolition favored her uh, prominently. The Democrats nominated the uh, first of the really dark horse candidates, one really, no one really expected to win, James K. Polk. 
former governor of Tennessee. He'd been the thief for election just the previous year. Um, the Whigs go again with Henry Clay. Figure this time is a Henry Clay's uh, chance. Close election, though. Um, Polk and Nevada expansionists wants all of Texas and all of Oregon, so bring them both in, bounce two out. But Clay's trying to play both sides. He's a slave owner himself. His brother, as a cousin, Cassius Clay, is a problem abolitionist, but Clay is a slaveholder. But he'd like to have Texas, but he doesn't want to antagonize Mexico. He doesn't want to antagonize both halves of the Whig Party. He's kind of waffling back and forth, telling both sides different things. Like I said, really caught in the process of getting the cotton Whigs and the conscience Whigs angrier and angrier at the same time. So Clay ultimately decides, probably, that. Texas should be annexed, but he's not going to tell the cotton of ways that. So, the popularity of Texas issue, Texas with Southern Whigs, of course, uh, ended up costing with Northern Whigs. And all these Northern Whigs started backing the Liberty Party. The James G. Burnham, formerly a Southerner, moved to the North, outspoken abolitionist. And it's probably this Texas issue that ended up costing a Clay the election. Very narrow election. Uh, Polk wins with 49.5% of the popular vote, but he wins the majority of the electoral votes, 170 electoral votes. Clay gets 48% of the vote, 105 electoral votes. Bernie gets the remaining 2.5% of no electoral votes. Now, in New York, Clay lost the election by 5,000 votes. Bernie got 15,000 votes. Bernie hadn't been on the ballot, or been, Clay had just been a little bit more popular in New York. He would have won those votes and uh, won New York's 36 electoral votes, which would have put him over the top, over Polk. That's it. Polk wins New York instead. Uh, and ironically, Polk was just a little bit popular in Tennessee and won its 11 electoral votes from uh, Clay, it wouldn't have been an issue anyway. Here's another thing about this whole thing. A lot of people refused to vote for Clay because of the corrupt bar in 1824. They still accused him of trying to steal the election. Like I said, an accusation that haunted him for the rest of his political career. He kept hearing about the corrupt bar. So all that put together, you have President James K. Polk. Tyler, in his last days of president, got a joint resolution getting Congress to admit Texas as a state. Basically, if they can't get a, I mean, a two-thirds majority vote to approve the treaty, they'll get a majority vote by the houses as a law. Texas is a state. Passed by February 26, 1845, the Senate by one vote. Passes the uh, House of Representatives in January of 1845. By December 28th, 26th, the Texas is admitted as the 28th state in the Union. It's Tyler that really initiates politics, manifest destiny, and artists. President Polk is probably the most successful one-term president in history. Basically, he had three things he wanted. Independent sub-treasury, annexation of Texas, annexation of Oregon. He gets the independent sub-treasury, annexes Texas. Basically, it's already a fact by the time he becomes president, March 1845. Formally, by December of 1845. And now, Oregon. Polk wanted the settlement of Oregon country, settlement could issue of Oregon once and for all. Then perhaps pushing for all of it up to the northern border, which is now British Columbia, the 54 degree 40 minute line. They're saying 54, 40 or fight. They want to go to war over Oregon. In his inaugural address, Polk lays claim to all of it. Negotiations with the border emerge. Uh, Polk eventually orders the 49th parallel, the same border from the um, Convention of 1818, the border across the northern Plains states. The British aren't satisfied. He notifies the British in 1846 they break off the joint occupation in 1847. The British made another offer of 49th parallel control of all Vancouver Island. The Senate accepted this in June of 1846. He avoided war but alienated those who wanted all of Oregon. But the hits of Oregon shows the coming parts of three states Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, and the issue is settled. So he gets the third thing he wanted settlement over Oregon. So he's batting a thousand. But the acquisition of Oregon, though, 
made an acquisition of Texas power, balance between the two, slave Texans for free Oregon. But questions over the Texas border are interrupting the war, causing another huge problem, the Mexican War.